man. Why? Why? This, this, there's no air conditioning in this apartment. It's already, it's already almost 80 degrees outside. Yeah. Turn off the fans. That's one of those things where Vancouver doesn't need air conditioning except for the two days that you're there. Yeah, 50, 51 <laughs> weeks out of the year. 50 weeks out of the year, they don't need air conditioning. And then there's and then the week I'm that here. you visit. Yeah. yeah 25 like degrees. 93 degrees. Yeah. Ugh. It's so funny because Ryan's um, co-founder is, lives here half the year. And uh -huh. so we're, we're, that's one of the reasons we're here so they can work together. Okay. And um, we were standing outside after we got coffee and he's like, and I was like, oh, this is just about perfect. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, well, I was like, what's perfect temperature for you? And he's like, oh, like 18 to 25. And I was like, is that like this temperature? <laughs> And he's like, yeah, this is like, this is probably like, you know, 19. What is that in so. outdated American temperature? And I was like, okay, so I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, okay, so it's 68 right now. This feels good for you? And he's like, yeah. I was like, okay, so we have like our baseline of understanding uh, like what, because he can't convert it into Fahrenheit. Just, even, uh, even though he lives in the, the US half the time. 30. That's what double, he said. And I was like, that double. seems unscientific. No, it's because <laughs> what you do it is you multiply, it by, yeah. you multiply it by 1.8. Uh, and add 32, but to round it out, you just multiply by two and add by add 30 more. All right. It doesn't get you the exact number, but it gets you in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. So say it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit right now. To do the reverse, you subtract 15, 30, so you end up with 50, and then you divide 50 by two, and it's 25. See. Okay. And that that'll start to learn you what they okay. what they generally mean to but okay. you know they do they do clothes oh, well, sizes yeah. or they do people sizes and feet and inches they kind of right. got halfway through the metric system and sort of forgot about it <laughs> that's our fault I'm like oh, wait a minute we have to export these clothings to the u.s so they these need to clothes. be in feet and inches yes that huge textile industry that powers canada Oh, it's all based in Roots, the clothing store. The only Roots I know is the one on the... Uh... Oh, yeah. Roots is supposed to be good, right? Yeah, I like to Roots. Roots. I'm going to go to Roots tonight, I think, after work. We have one in LA, actually. Do you? Mm -hmm. Down in Little San Francisco, or, or as it's known, Abbott Kinney. I'm going to go to okay. Lululemon Lab. Oh, wait. That's where the Lululemons get born. <laughs> is it? <laughs> Wait, do they tailor something specifically to your ass? Like they get like a laser machine or laser um, guide and to kind of like get you a perfect oh, custom fit outfit? Maybe, maybe. Because that'd be kind of cool because that would be something people would pay like slightly more, not a lot more, but like clothes tailored exactly to your measurements. Yeah, a bunch of people have tried that. None of them ever catch on though. Because no one wants to pay like the 200% markup. It's like, yeah. You just said people would pay for it though. No, I said they would pay a little bit. I think they would pay slightly more, but not a lot more. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? Uh, mm -hmm. Control and going to hide. All right. Control is yours. You have, you have the con. Con. All right. Here we go. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Do you want to help out the Daily Tech News Show? Well, it's really easy. Just go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support and find out how. Thank you. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 31st, 2017. I'm Tom Merritt. Thanks again to Roger Chang and Justin Robert Young and Jen Cutter and Paul Spain for covering the show Thursday and Friday. We're back. And Veronica Belmont is with us. How are you? Hello. I'm You're good. in How Vancouver. You? Yes, I am in Vancouver, Canada, specifically. Yeah. There is a Vancouver, United States as well. That is not too far away. Yeah, but you're not there. I'm not there. You're not there. We're yeah. in a national show today, uh, and we're going to talk about AIs creating secret languages. You know, like you and your friend did when you were four years old. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I didn't do invent my own. I was more of a pig Latin kind of person. Ah, right, right. But myself. it's along the same lines: code words, slang. Uh, AIs are doing it, and you've probably seen some scare headlines around. We're going to bust through some of the fud around those, but talk about the real intriguing part of this which is should you let them do that <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah we'll, we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more later all right let's start with a few tech things you should know 
Microsoft has stopped development of its WordFlow keyboard for iOS. The Microsoft Garage page for WordFlow now directs users to download Microsoft-owned SwiftKey as an alternative. Oh, I didn't actually know what WordFlow was, so I guess Not I don't have to miss late. it too much. Yeah. <laughs> Go download the Swift key. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. HBO said Monday that attackers had stolen data, including upcoming programming. Entertainment Weekly reports the theft includes a script for an upcoming episode of Game of Thrones. I have heard it is next week's episode, though I cannot confirm that at this time. Yeah, right. I, I heard that too, and and I was not in, I was not curious to look. I'm like, yeah, you know I, what? I just want to watch next week's episode when it comes. Reading the script is not going to help me. Yeah, uh, it's a bummer. It's a bummer, but it happens. Just show, yeah. goes to show how much people want it. U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe ruled late Friday that iPhone 4 and iPhone 4S user, or maybe there's more than one. <laughs> Actually, there are. Uh, two people brought the suit, so there's at least those two. May bring a nationwide class action claim against Apple for disabling FaceTime in the older models. Now, she didn't find them guilty. She just said, I'm not going to dismiss this prima facie. I'm going to let them bring it to trial. Apple disabled FaceTime on iOS 6 and older systems in April 2014. And since you can't put that on the iPhone 4 and 4S, uh, iPhone se iOS 7 on the iPhone 4 and 4S, basically FaceTime stopped working for those iPhones. Yeah, that's a that's kind of a cruddy situation for sure. Like, yeah. Especially if it's something that was working and then no longer works. Yeah, I mean, it's a bummer. Uh, Judge Coe said, look, you had advertisements for the iPhone 4 and 4S that said, look, FaceTime, it's what makes the iPhone an iPhone. <laughs> so you advertised it as being an essential feature. So you have right. to defend yourself on that. Uh, AMD announced the RX Vega high performance graphics cards will launch on August 14th. The Radeon RX Vega 64 sells for $499. RX Vega 56 sells for $399. It's also a version of the 64 with an aluminum shroud for $599. That only comes in a bundle, though. You can't buy it on its own. And there's a water-cooled 64 for $699. Mm. Cards are follow-ups to the Fury graphics cards from AMD, and they're positioning them not as more powerful, but as an affordable alternative to the GTX 1080 and 1070 from NVIDIA. Awesome. Developer Steve Trotton Smith found references to the next iPhone and early firmware released for the forthcoming Apple HomePod. References to infrared face detection appeared in the Biometric Kit framework uh, currently being used for Touch ID. References are made to a device called D22 with a glyph that makes it look as if it will be in the next iPhone. And it's that same like all screen except for a little notch right at the top where the camera would probably be. Uh, Home HomePod wasn't supposed to have its firmware released. That's that's the uh, that's the problem here is that Steve Trout and Smith found that, uh, and Apple immediately yanked it. But he's like, hey, a lot of other people noticed it too, so it's out there now. And we've combed through the code and found this stuff. So you'll hear lots of leaks from people saying I have an inside source, but this came from Apple unintentionally, but it came from Apple. So that makes it appear that they are certainly prepared to have some kind of infrared laser or infrared face detection in the iPhone. Yeah, I mean, it's not really a, a leak so much as a just accidental, well, I guess it's kind of a leak. I guess, yeah. No, <laughs> it's an it, internal leak. It, it, it's, no, you're, you're right though. It's like, yeah. well, it's not a leak because we call other things leaks that aren't actually leaks, right? right. <laughs> this is literally what a leak is. Uh, and, and we use it to refer to people spreading rumors so often that we forget that like this, this is it. Unintentional. Oops, it came out. Not unintentional. I'm going to tell you off the record, sort of thing. But what do you think of that? What do you think of face unlock for the iPhone? I think it's great. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> like I would, I, 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 hmm. I wonder how. I, I'm sure it has some detection, uh, like versus having glasses on or off, or if your sunglasses are on. You know, you know my. I that they get like people of different races correct because that's been an issue with face detection stuff in the past. But I guess if it's mapped to your own face, that should be okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm excited to try it and see how it works. My Surface Book can tell me with my glasses on or off. Uh, yeah. The only the only problems it has is when I'm too close. And then mm -hmm. even when I lean out, it seems to not be able to find me anymore. Uh, <laughs> but if I'm, if I'm at the right distance, I can have a hat on, I can have glasses on. It seems to work pretty good. Now, the problem is also people have been able to fool these things with pictures that are rounded yeah. or molded or, or whatever. So that can be an issue as well. 
whole new host of problems. Yeah. An Australian robot called Cartman, uh, probably Cartman, not, not South Park Cartman, but it's C-A-R-T-M-A-N, won the 2017 Amazon Robotics Challenge. Uh, robots in that challenge have to sort items into a box, then take items out of a box, and then do a combo of both. And Cartman was actually tops at doing both. Uh, was able to do the put them in, pull them out combo test, the best of all of them. And that's why it ended up winning. Uh, the Australian Center for Robotic Vision made Cartman using a sliding mechanism, kind of like the claw toy mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> a little bit. And it would pick up items from above rather than pretty much everybody else using a robotic arm that had to reach over the box. Cartman also costs less to make, uh, $30,000 Australian, about $24,000 US, which was one of the least expensive robots in the competition. It's totally Cartman. Just say Cartman. Cartman. Miss Cartman. He, res <laughs> he respects Amazon's authority. Apparently. This I love, this story. Honolulu has instituted a fine for pedestrians caught looking at their phone while crossing the street starting October 25th. Fines start at $15, up to $99 for repeat offenders. Honolulu has a high incidence of crosswalk impacts. Yeah, the mayor of Honolulu said they have one of the highest in the country, not the highest. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyone who's ever been to Waikiki <laughs> knows that that's kind of the epicenter for, for uh, pedestrians doing things that they shouldn't be doing. One oh. of them is looking at their phones when they cross the street. Now, I agree in principle that people shouldn't be looking at their phones when they cross the street. I understand the impulse to institute a fine for people's own protection and the you know the protection of drivers too. You know, mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, big time. Because if you see someone who's not paying attention, you may get distracted and then, you know, all kinds of other cascading things can happen. But if you're not consistently finding people, does it really do any good? Well, and if I mean, cops, do you think, cops do you, don't want to be like, I'm on checking for people checking their phone beat, right? I think it's good for awareness. I think it, I don't know how much it has really helped cell phones in cars, which is law here in California. Mm -hmm. At least that you can't be, you can't, you'll, you will get ticketed if they catch you yeah. if you're on your cell phone while you're driving. But I see people doing it all the time and they never get caught. So I think it's good to at least get it into people's minds that this is something they should be thinking about. And it's, I mean, the ticket price is so low that it's not really like. It's a nuisance fine. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's annoying, but you'll think about it the next time you're crossing the street, which is, I think, what they want people to do. Yeah. Although. The majority of people in some parts of Honolulu anyway are tourists, are, are tourists right? And may not even be aware of that. So I guess you have to put up big signs. I, I don't know. I, I definitely admire the principle. I'm just not sure if this will work. Well, what would work? Do I you don't know? know. Do you know? Maybe just a public awareness campaign is, you mm -hmm. know, more than the fines. Because I feel like what's going to happen is the cops aren't going to add this fine unless unless something else happens. And if that something else happened is a pedestrian getting hurt, like I don't know that they need to add a fine on top of you getting hit by a car. Fifteen dollars on top of that little lady. <laughs> on top of your two million dollars in hospital bills. All right, a group of Bitcoin entrepreneurs and developers are planning a fork of the Bitcoin blockchain to be called Bitcoin Cash starting next week. Uh, and in fact, it could go into effect tar starting August 1st. That is the earliest that it could go into effect. It may or may not. There's a lot of angst about this. The group Bitcoin Cash wants to speed up how Bitcoin transactions are processed by allowing for blocks of transactions larger than a megabyte. And by comparison, Visa can do like 1,600 transactions a second. The blockchain right now is doing six transactions <laughs> A second. Also, there's a transaction fee involved. And so people who put low transaction fees can sometimes see their transactions take days to get processed. Core developers of Bitcoin, however, oppose the change, saying it would reduce the number of people capable of processing transactions. Because even if you, right now, the, the limit is one megabyte per block. If you make that two megabytes, that's twice the amount of data that has to be mined, which means you need a lot more computing power, which means some people will no longer be able to afford processing the transactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you have fewer people processing transactions, that could allow companies to take control of the network. Part of the blockchain's brilliance is having a large number of people processing so no one person can dominate the network. 
Anyway, the core does have a plan called segregated witness or segwit that could speed up transactions without needing to change the block size. But the Bitcoin Cash Group does not believe it's fast enough. There's also segwit two, which increases the block size a little bit, uh, but not as much as Bitcoin Cash wants to. Anyway, if this plan goes in, if they fork blockchain and, and create two versions of Bitcoin, current holders of Bitcoins would also hold an equivalent amount of Bitcoin Cash at the split. Now, that's if you have a private wallet. If you're keeping your Bitcoins in an exchange, that might not work that way because each exchange is setting their policies different. Okay. Splitting your wallets is a whole complicated mess that you shouldn't do without doing a lot of research about it. The next web, though, basically recommends removing Bitcoins from exchanges into a private wallet and then avoiding any transactions after August 1st until the future is more certain. <laughs> Sounds complicated. Yeah, does any of this make sense? Like, it, I, it, it barely makes sense to me, and I've, I've been doing a lot of reading about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but you kind of have to understand how the blockchain works. The blockchain works by saying everybody in the network can process a transaction and record it to the ledger so that it's hard to fake, right? right if somebody right. tries to fake one, then all the rest of the processors will go, no, that's not what I got. So your, your result gets thrown out. And that's what keeps it secure. But if you make it harder to process them by making the block bigger and you have fewer people processing them, then there's more of a chance that you could organize the existing processors to say, hey, let's all fake something together. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And, and then, and, but on the other hand, because it's so small, it takes a long time to process the transactions, which is why the Bitcoin cash people are like, let's, let's make it bigger. We'll still have enough processors, we think, but we can do a whole lot more transactions that way. So trying to find like a happy medium. Yeah, they're not finding it right mm. now. Uh, there, there's lots of, I mean, as you can imagine on the internet, lots of angry people on either side of this issue. Oh. <laughs> I know. Shocking, isn't it? Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. It's available as a podcast on the Amazon Echo and in the Anchor app in the App Store. And that is a look at our top stories. All right. Uh, on July 14th, Mark Wilson wrote up a story on Fast Company about AI research at Facebook. It has slowly percolated across the net as news that Facebook had to shut down an AI yeah. after it started developing a language humans couldn't understand. Okay, okay. Calm down, everyone. Not quite. Not quite yet. No, no. Uh, you should go back and read the July 14th article, which is two weeks old now. Uh, Dhruv Batra, visiting research scientist from Georgia Tech at Facebook AI Research, told Fast Company they did not program a reward into one of their AI training regimens for sticking to English. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was something that they just didn't do. And so the two AIs uh, that were using generative adversarial networks uh, started to come up with their own variant on yeah. English because it was more efficient. Yeah, essentially, they were making shorthand for themselves. And yeah. the problem with this, of course, is that the, the AIs could get to a point where they're having a, a conversation that they understand together that we do not understand at all. Yeah. And so if you're over the age of 18, think about listening to teenagers talk. It's like that. Perfect example. Perfect example. So it looks like gobbledygook. It, like it doesn't make any sense to us from 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 where we're standing. But at the same time, there's this there's this kind of discussion of, OK, well, do we do we not want these computers to work at their highest capacity possible? Like, isn't that why we're creating artificial intelligence so that computers are able to solve problems and find answers and come up with solutions? solutions at incredible speeds that we can't do with regular computing power or with our simple human monkey minds. But the, the downside of that, of course, is if artificial intelligence starts making up shorthand for itself, I think there's this, this fear in our minds that they're going to start talking to each other in a way that we can't understand. Therefore, we lose our control over the situation in some kind of very <laughs> meaningful and important uh, and species ending way. Uh, <laughs> so, so they, they but the, the reason that FAIR shut it down isn't because isn't Facebook AI research, isn't because 
they were scared that the, the AI was going to take over, you know, Facebook's computers and, and get out into the internet and all this stuff that I think people start getting a little concerned about. They just did it because they're like, we're building AI that can communicate with humans. Like that's the, like part of the project that we're doing. And if it can't communicate with humans, if we can't ask it simple questions to get responses that we understand, that's, you know, out of the bounds of the, the research that we're trying to do. So the, 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 it, it found something interesting, and maybe other people will take it to, their, to the next logical conclusion. But right now, that's not that's not the purpose of the projects they're working on. Yeah, but it Mike is Lewis, interesting. Mike Lewis at Fair said, "Our interest was having bots who could talk to people. That that's yeah. what they were trying to train. It was a negotiation exercise, and generative adversarial networking or, or training means that you have them." talk to each other. You have two IAs talk to each other in order to get better. And if they're talking to each other and getting better at talking in a way that only they can understand, it doesn't fit the, the parameters of the project anymore. Right, right. <laughs> because we want them to be able to talk to humans. But like you said, this isn't the first time that this has happened. Uh, they, the, a lot of these headlines out there that are rewriting this story are saying, ah, Facebook discovered that they, these AIs had gone off on their own. And it's like, no, this isn't an entirely unexpected result. In fact, the original Fast Company article links to three separate studies mm -hmm. noting the existence of this sort of thing happening. This is a normal thing. And the more important question isn't, have they run amok? But what it, what is the risk and is there a risk to allowing this because like you said, it's way more efficient. I mean, it's more efficient for us too. Anybody who's been in any kind of industry knows that industry specific jargon that helps you more efficiently communicate with people. But yeah. then when you use that jargon outside of the industry, the rest of us go, I have no idea what you just said. Yeah, it's I mean- like when I was explaining blockchain earlier. Exactly, it, or it's like exactly like shorthand. It is like almost the definition of shorthand. Like yeah, I yeah. can, like people can write in shorthand or type or whatever in, in incredible speeds. But if you look at, a, an alpha shorthand alphabet or, or code or whatever, however you call it, you'd be like, what are these lines and dots and scribbles? Like this doesn't make any sense, but it's still English and it's still a way of communicating. It's just a lot more efficient. So this is what computers are doing. I wonder if there's a way to program the AI to document its changes. Like figure so, out, like tell us why it's happening. Yeah. yeah. So I think as Uh-huh. Some of the most the the most interesting thing about AI is that we don't really understand how some of it works. I mean, they talk a little bit about this in in the article, which is it does things for reasons, and we don't really know exactly what the process for coming up with those reasons are or is. Um, and so I, I love that they say we didn't give it a reward for sticking to English. And for me, that's so it's just that's how you think about training animals and people like reward based behavior. And now we have to work rewards in for doing something that's tedious for an AI to do because it's like, ugh, ugh, yeah, fine. I guess I'll talk in English if I get what what is a reward? <laughs> What, what would it even want? I mean, this is obviously like they put something in the code that, that keep the reminds it probably to but just says, yes, you're on the right structure. path. Yeah. yeah. I keep going this way. This is the right thing. Green light, red light. Um, but that's, I just, I just love the idea that we have to like give it a, they use the word reward because that is, <laughs> that's so perfect. Well, there's a psychological uh, prejudice there because it's not really a reward. The no, program I know. just sees it as, ah, I'm executing properly when I do that, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. the same thing is true for language. I mean, I hadn't thought about it till you just said it, but we don't know what AI, why it makes the decisions it makes already. So there's mm -hmm. really no difference between that and having it create this language if it's just using it internally, so to speak, and to talk to other AI. But psychologically, it makes us afraid because we're like, what is it saying? Is it plotting yeah. our downfall? Yeah, we can't, like, we can't handle it. Like, but it's it, no difference than what is it thinking? We have very fragile kind of like human egos and we get very concerned to think that the machines, which we already know are capable of, of doing things faster and better than we are, now are working outside, even further outside the bounds of what we understand and what we have, you know, kind of engineered them to be able to do. And I think that's just something that as humans, we're going to have to either figure out how to be comfortable with or figure out how to, but it's just like people. The more you try to rein them in, the more they're going to like <laughs> try to try to break out of their box, well, I feel like. The I, rules aren't always going to hold. I think it's important for 
productivity of an artificial intelligence to allow it to have the most efficient communication possible. And when it's with non-humans, that may be an AI created language. Mm -hmm. Is that riskier than ha than have what we have now, which is it's thinking thoughts that we don't know. At that point, it's just communicating with other AIs. We can see by its output what, what it's doing. And when it's a, a an internal quote unquote thought, we're like, we don't really care how it got there. It's doing the right thing should we care any more about it talking with another AI as long as it does the right thing, as long as the output is the same? I mean, yeah, but we don't know what other information it's passing through in those encounters. I mean, well, we, never we already acts know. on that information. Will it never act or will it remember? <laughs> well, it's an outside possibility, I suppose, but it's not the most likely one. I'm just saying, like, yeah, yes, yeah, we, yeah. we definitely want, I mean, this is something that we talk about with bots all the time is that the, in a perfect world, your Facebook Messenger bots will be able to talk to your Slack bots, will be able to talk to your, you know, your your Amazon Echo, et cetera, et cetera, and that these things will become less platform dependent. Um, and, you know, that would really be like the kind of the holy grail of this whole situation where like they don't have to stay in their walled gardens. They can communicate and actually make your life easier by talking to each other and figuring out your needs based on what each of them is experiencing. Um, but they need a language to do that. Yeah, they need and some kind of like bot markup language in order to like communicate independently. And I think artificial intelligence and how that, you know, this is, these are, I'm talking about two separate things here, bots and artificial intelligence, because they're not necessarily dependent on each other. Um, but AI needs to do that too. And so it needs to come up with its own way of, of, of talking across platforms or across devices. Like if your smart fridge is talking to your, your cell phone, which is talking to the cloud, which is talking to whatever, there's all these different things, these connections happening. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting, but they, they have, they are figuring out more efficient ways to, to transfer that information. And I don't know if we should stand in the way of that. Yeah, I, I, I am not unfrightened <laughs> like the rest <laughs> of you, but I'm, but I'm trying to be rational about the fact that, you know, a lot of what's going on with AI, we already can't check. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do we do we go with behavior based judgments on whether it's a problem or not? Or and I'll go back to my earlier idea. Is there a way to have it log itself so that you could go and learn its language? Although that's problematic. You know how long it takes people to learn languages. If the language is sophisticated enough, it, it could take a year to learn the AI's language. So, well, one, one other thing that I loved is that like in, the English language is so dumb. Yeah. Like, there's so many homonyms and like things that like just don't make any sense to even really smart people from who speak other languages. And so, of course, the computer is going to be like, why do you have the same word for a thing that means two completely different things? Like, that's stupid. I'm going to. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the advantage is you don't need an API anymore. The AIs just learn to talk to each other on their own. You don't have to write a set of rules that says, here's how you access this other program. You just tell them, go work it out. You want to Facebook Messenger? You want to talk to Slack? Go talk to Slack in your private little Slack Messenger language. In your little smarty bot language, yeah. yeah. No, it's crazy. Uh, well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them, stories like that, at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and facebook.com slash dailytechnewsshow. Uh, real quickly, want to mention there's a new column from Sakani Wright up at dailytechnewsshow.com. He writes the Your Private Driver column. He is a driver, and he's got a driver's view on the changes happening at Uber not the changes at the CEO level that you see covered in all the business publications, but the changes for the drivers, the things that are, you know, helping uh, them with customer support and all of that. If you're interested, go check it out, dailytechnewsshow.com. And we get to the messages of the day. Uh, first of all, Renard wrote in, uh, uh, responding to Roger's discussion of the Amazon Hub. Amazon Hub is Amazon's effort to put lockers into... Uh -huh places like apartment complexes so that any shipping could use them to deliver packages. And Renard writes, hey, UPS has been doing the exact same type of thing. They did reference there are others doing this, but it seems as if anything comes out of Amazon is too often thought of as the first to do this. They don't usually reinvent the wheel. Now, Renard sent a link to the USP access point lockers, which are 
great. And as Roger says, super handy. But Roger said, while UPS and Amazon have been rolling out storage lockers in public places for some time, I disagree that they're the same thing. Amazon's hub initiative is directed at placing storage lockers within apartment buildings or housing complexes, which is something the housing complexes can do on their own. I've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. uh, but Amazon is doing it for them, which makes it easier. Regardless of how convenient heading to a local store or business to take a package out of a locker is, it's not as convenient as heading down to the lobby of your building uh, to do that. So uh, good good point for, for Renard, though, that there are similar things out there. And I, it, it's always good to get checked on this because when a company like Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft gets big enough, a lot of times we they they sound like they're the first to do something, even though smaller companies have been doing it before. Right. I am kind of excited about this hub situation, honestly. Um, I don't live in an apartment complex, but I would have loved that. Uh, I have to make use of an Amazon locker to return something uh -huh. next week, which is kind of annoying because it's it's not in my path of travel, really. Mm. Um, so you know, there's, there's. It would be nice to be able to have more of those around, and I like that they have the 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 different box sizes, lockers, and it's yeah. You could do it for your own home too. You can just go uh, buy a U.S. Postal Service approved locker, and it works with the the major delivery services. Really, and just put it, yeah, just put it downstairs by your garage or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, that they you don't they don't just work for apartment complexes, but again, Amazon's targeting apartment complexes with their thing. Right, it makes more sense for for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, we got an email from Ross in equally sunny and rainy Nottingham, United Kingdom. Said I was listening to the show last week when you were discussing the use of fingerprints as the only factor of authentication and identification while traveling through airports, and this made me think of biohacking. You said that if a fingerprint becomes compromised, this authentication factor couldn't be updated or changed like a password could, and you only have nine changes you could make. He says, realistically, it's fewer than nine, given you'd probably be asked to enroll multiple fingerprints in a lot of services. In the world of multi-factor authentication, there are three types of factors. Something you know, like your password, something you have, like an RSA token or a smart card or a YubiKey, and something you are. That's your fingerprint, your iris, et cetera. Ross says, you're going to like this, Veronica. I would suggest this is an area where biohacking could really be the way forward. Although uh -oh. the idea of having a chip inserted in my hand feels somewhat gruesome to me, the token that is inserted could be considered as changing factor type from something you have to something you are once it becomes part of your body. It's sufficiently difficult to remove in order to impersonate identity, but it is sufficiently easy to replace or perhaps recycle the token ID VRF should it become compromised. Coupled with something you know to provide that crucial second factor, this would provide the surety to the authorities that you are who you say you are when you're traveling. Nice. Yeah, that would be nice. My, um, my passport is expiring the week after I get back from Vancouver. Sure, it would be nice if I just had a little chip that was like, yeah. Beep. Yeah, just update Beep. it. Just, but that would be uh, hard for, uh, but that would make me scared for people who are like fleeing countries for persecution and stuff like that and have to, I don't know, it makes me, that kind of stuff makes me nervous. Did I veer yeah. off topic? Well, no, it's a, it, that's a fair concern. My guess is in those situations, it, it, you know, there's the difference between the issue, this be mandatory or optional, right? right? It could be like, hey, if you're comfortable with having the chip implanted, you can speed through the line a little faster. If you're not, you're going to have to be in the But right what if you're point. comfortable with it now? But say, for example, well, within the next three years, you're not comfortable with it anymore and you want it you out. Remove it. You just remove it. I mean, just remove it. I, but it is removable, unlike your fingerprints. That's true. I think that's what Ross is saying the advantage is. Yeah. Do you know how problem. many people sent me that article about the implants? Oh, yeah. The, they know like, you well. Implants. I was like, oh, 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 I built a reputation for myself. <laughs> well, uh, thanks to Veronica Belmont for bringing her reputation to our show. Uh, always happy to. Uh, yeah, you can check out uh, my, my day job is growbot.io. Um, you can also check out IRL, the podcast I'm doing with Mozilla. We've got a new episode coming out next Monday. It's all about trolls. Ooh, how to deal with them or how to ignore them or both? All of the above. Woohoo! All of the above. Check that out, IRLpodcast.org. Uh, thanks to everybody who gives a little value back to this show for the value they get for it, including Bob Leidner, Greg Wilson, Ashley Kinzel, and many, many more at patreon.com 
slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja and Rob Reed. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Boom. Good show. What should we call it? Uh, Who's backing a- up? Yeah, that's that's where I am. Sorry. For a second, I thought you said Ryan, not where I am. That's Ryan. Whenever he backs up, he goes, Oh, he has a deep zone. That's great. Hey, Roger. Yes, Roger, we can hear you. All right. Um, oh, wait. Let me just, just stop this. Uh, talk Bati to me. A slap in the FaceTime. <laughs> Digital Tower of Babel. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't speak English anymore. Prima Fasa time. Fascia. Prima Fascia time. A robot of sorts. Just the bits. Simple human monkey minds. Actually, human. Simple monster. human monkey minds is my simple minds monkeys cover band. <laughs> I like simple uh, human monkey minds. It's kind of great. I kind of love that. <laughs> yeah. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my RAM? Lost yeah. in digital translation. Nice. Go That's a good one, too. Go without the word flow. Australia respects Cartman's authority. That's funny. Respect my authority. Tom will have to explain Bitcoin Cash to Scott. Don't talk the talk if you can't bot the bot. Yeah, the Bitcoin thing is weird because you really have to understand a lot of it. And then it's not... The problem is more difficult to understand than the solution. The solution is just you replicate the blockchain. I mean, the blockchain is... You can think of it as a big file. And so Bitcoin Cash is just saying, well, we'll just start our own blockchain. And the history of our new blockchain is the history of the existing blockchain up until the moment we fork it. Mm-hmm. And so that's why your wallet can exist in both systems. Both universes. Yeah. It's like an alternate universe, right? It's basically the DC universe, which they collapsed. But um, Simple, well, talk body to me is at the top, but we can go with simple human monkey minds. I mean, how could we not? I kind of love it, yeah. Simple human monkey minds. Man, how long has that truck been backing up? I don't know, dude. I'm not out there directing the truck. Jeez. Very obviously not out there directing the truck. What did I run into the other day that was beeping... It was beeping when it went forward and backwards. So I'm like, well, you, then now you're just beeping all the time. Your beeping means nothing anymore. Maybe yeah. beeping just means it's around. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. Simple human monkey minds. Simple, Simple human monkey minds. minds it is. Mm-hmm. What do you? What would you put in the simple human monkey minds uh, play? Uh, uh, set list. <laughs> Last train to Clarksville. And then, uh, don't you forget about me? Yeah. What was the other big Wait, Simple Minds that- song? You'll probably have more monkey songs than Simple Minds. Yes. There's Daydream Believer. Um, there's, of course, the monkey theme song. Hey, where are the monkeys? Hey, where are the simple minds? <laughs> People say our minds are simple. We're too busy creating our own language. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. I like, don't you forget about the last train to Clarksville. Just make them all. Combo titles. Simple Minds discography. I didn't appreciate Simple Minds when they were new. I don't really appreciate them now. I learned to love them more later on in life. Mm. Uh, I. It's like the one song that everyone is 
familiar with because of uh, Breakfast Club. Yeah. See, like, no one ever remembers the other songs. Like, I, I used to, uh, let's see. And I always confuse them with psychedelic furs because of that. No. It's because John Hughes pulled his set list from a bunch of similar looking artists. Actually, no, the psychedelic furs don't look like anything like the Simple Minds. Only in Northern Town? Is that a Simple Minds song? No, that's um, Life in a Northern Town is. Life in a Northern Town. Only a Northern Song is a Paul McCartney song. I was confusing them. Which is that band? Is a Dream Academy. Ah, I was about see, to say Ultravox, but it now was not I've got Ultravox. Simple Minds confused with my Dream Academy. It's, it's just the North. It's just a North England mm-hmm. thing. I used to think that everyone in England that wasn't in London lived in like little vidges, villages, and little homes hamlets. Built, huh? <laughs> little hamlets. Yeah. Like that's all these music videos. They're like in the middle of nowhere looking at a cow while they're singing. Why are they looking at a cow? I don't know. Because there's cows in the countryside. Sure. There are. At least in England. And, and the they have very they have very quaint uh, uh gregarious post postmen. Chatty. Chatty postman. Yeah. Our postman just um, talks to people on the phone. That seems to be the new post postal carrier behavior. I used to have one guy when I was a kid. I think he had Tourette syndrome because he was alive always... and kicking. Thank you, Dark Redeemer. That's that's the big simple mindset. Yes. He was always swearing every time I saw him. Maybe it was me. He was swearing at me. I don't know. <laughs> he smiled and waved, but he went away, and I could hear him swearing. And I, I, I didn't know about Tourette's until like five years later. I was like, ah, oh, wonder if he had Tourette's. Mm, probably that would make me paranoid if someone smiled and waved and then muttered curses at me as they walked away Mm. san francisco i mean what was i supposed to think what everyone does heard of san francisco huh yeah you none of us are in it right now oh yeah that's true whoa Whoa. Blew my mind. Mind equals blown. I was about to talk baseball and then I realized don't shouldn't do that. Don't do it right now. Saw that game out of the corner of my eye. I thought of you. Sympathetic. So, uh, how about them Vancouver clouds? They're up in the sky. Wait, wait, they don't have the. There's only one baseball team in Canada now. The Expos left. No, I'm literally talking about the clouds in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> like the weather. And they lost. Although their... Vancouver clouds would be a good name for a sports ball team. Uh, they lost their NBA team, right? They had the Grizzlies. No, is that the Grizzly? Yeah, They've got the no, Canucks, Jim. the NHL. I think, yeah, it's the only team, uh, professional sports team. And they have the BC Lions, CFL. Go Lions. Go Lions. Ah, that's what Voltron was before it was called Voltron. I have the toy. You have all the toys. I used to. And then I realized my dad shipped a bunch of them to my cousin in Taiwan. When, oh, one really? Year I, one year I wasn't looking. and I was looking for some of the stuff. It's like, where'd it go? The classic, uh, get, get the toys out of there while the yeah. child isn't looking. But he'll keep his, you know, 40-odd years of National Geographic off, like, over by the wall. So my nephew is going to archaeology school in Canberra, Australia, and... They went out on a dig. It's his first dig as a student. And there were goats in the field next. So they diligently put up, you know, wires around the dig and start the the beginning. And if you know anything about archaeology, you have to go very carefully, you know, just removing small amounts and looking for anything. Uh, And then they close up for the night. They come back and there's little baby goats 
crawling all over their dig <laughs> because they had put up wires to keep the adult goats out, but the baby goats figured out how to get between the wires. Oh, baby goats. I love I baby goats. It was the cutest ruined archaeology site I've ever seen. <laughs> They're so tender. So tender. Shut up. Mm. God, there's water pouring down into this deck. I'm glad I wasn't sitting outside right now. Is it raining? Be watering their plants. No. Oh, they're watering their plants. That's hilarious. That's really funny. <laughs> it's like all over. Like, I don't even know how it is getting. Like, there's an overhang, but somehow it's like arcing back. Do you hear that? No, I can't hear it. What is happening? Are they using a hose? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to take a video of it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's like a deluge out there. Deluge. <laughs> it is the dia deluge. Day of the luge. Is what that means. <laughs> All right. Hey, did you hear LA got the Olympics for 2028? Oh, really? Yeah. Good. Paris, Keep them out of San Francisco. Paris gets them for 2024. And then LA gets them for 2028. And it makes sense because Paris said that part of where they were redeveloping wouldn't be available after 2024 for reasons. Whereas mm -hmm. LA's whole pitch was we hardly have to build anything. We just have all the infrastructure. Yeah. We so, just need to renovate some of it. Yeah. And it gives them more time to renovate it. So sweep away the, uh, the tumbleweeds. Who's 2020 Olympics. Is that Korea? Wait, I can't remember now. No, Korea's the winter, right? I don't remember. Tokyo, right? Tokyo is the 2020. Oh, yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Duh. I have a shirt that says Tokyo 2020 on it. <laughs> and you can see Super Mario. Yeah, that's right. That's in Shinzo Abe was Mario at the closing ceremonies. How could I forget all this? Yes, Tokyo. Okay, good. North Korea. Thanks, Poodle Puncher. I don't think that's correct. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching and listening and enjoying your times. We will see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.